right, folks, what's going on? Welcome to the Monday Night Live stream. How's everybody doing? We got a We got quite a few comments that came rolled in here. So I'm about to check in with y'all guys right quick. All right, hold on. Let's get the vibe set here. Put some ones in the chats and whatnot if the volume is good. Everybody hears me clearly. We don't want to have any mishaps, right? All right. Absolutely. Tuning in with the folks here. All right. Black Boy Wellness, what's going on? Welcome. Good to see you in here. Look at that. Came through with the one immediately. Oh, here's a good con here's a good question. Can you be raw with Addison's disease? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, to my knowledge, absolutely. Uh, it makes the body lose sodium too much. I'm gonna address all these different. Th those are th those are good, some good things to address. When you say it makes the body lose sodium too much, I don't know what it means, but I can speculate. But I'll touch on that issue tonight. That's right. Finally made an early stream. Absolutely. Dr. Feel good. Feels good. What's going on? Welcome. Good to see you in here tonight. All right. Look at that. Coming through with the questions immediately. All right. Can you say if going raw would be the best for rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, it's very effective for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, you can either be raw to one degree or another. I think high raw or even fully raw uh, are both very good options uh, for that issue. And I can touch on that as well as uh, autoimmune disease in general. Uh, you know, because there are other factors at play, not just what you eat, but also uh, the environment you're in. And I spoke about um, environment on an earlier stream, I believe last week. Look at that we got some folks here chatting with each other in the comments i'd like to know too i've heard i'd heard to limit fruits but everyone tells you different information um yeah so basically it depends on i mean it depends on everything you do holistically right we can't really necessarily um do things or talk about nutrition in a vacuum right there's a lot of different factors that we got to talk about so you know when people make claims like oh you should limit fruit it's like well everything is kind of limited by default so when you say limit fruit or limit anything well limit it to what degree how much of a limitation should you put right um so telling somebody they should limit something is not really helpful because you're not giving them um at least a ballpark amount smart girl chronicles tuning in from atl what's going on good to see you in here Yes, ma'am. Oh, Angelina, thank you. I appreciate that. That's right. Love you back. Coming through with the love here. Absolutely. I'm feeling it tonight. Got the ones coming in here pretty good. There we go. Shalom and greetings, man of y'all. What's going on? Welcome. Absolutely. G. Ellis, what's going on? Welcome back. Absolutely got more ones here look at that a lot of y'all coming through with the comments for real if you haven't liked the stream yet definitely hit the like button and like the stream oh thoughts on the blood type food diet look at that coming i'm gonna have to do just straight up q a streams uh to my knowledge as it stands at the moment there is no evidence that supports the blood type diet uh you eat for your species and your goals not for your blood type Blood type is valid when doing blood transfusions or organ donations because you need matching tissues and organic substances. Um, so the reason why your blood type is valid is because if you put um, blood or any other type of organ tissue into um, your body, your immune system will view it as something foreign and invasive and attack it. Right, so that can call, that can wreak all kind of havoc in your body. You don't want that, so that's where blood type becomes important. That's right, Raymond. What's going on? Good to see you in here. Absolutely, elevated lady. What's going on? Good to see you in here as well. 
All right, just catching up with it with everybody in here before I, before I get started. I think I'm fasting too much, and now I'm skinny fat on a fruitarian diet. How to do body recomposition to stop the skinny fat madness? Oh, I, I'll, I'll talk about that too because you know, like I said, there's there are no magic bullets, right? So if you fast, you have to have a very good reason for why you do it. You have to have a plan uh, to produce the results um, that you're looking for. So there's a you can fast. But fasting in and of itself is not a magic bullet, right? You also have to have a training and diet structure that work all collectively to get you the, the results that you want. That's right. All right, folks. So let's get into it. Ooh, my tea is still scalding hot. I got ginger tea tonight in my big mug. It's everybody's favorite, favorite big big mug right when does it go from being a mug to being a cup <laughs> i don't know it's just, it's just popping to my mind right quick all right so uh i've heard i've heard that um being a raw vegan to make you protein deficient and skinny and frail and weak right that's what we came to talk talk about today uh because you hear a lot about this oh you need a lot of protein you need all this protein you know so you know you just, it's a deficient diet b12 all this type of stuff there's a lot of concerns so i want to talk about those concerns tonight right like how legitimate is this and for me i do not have um like a, a, a religious approach uh, to nutrition. I don't, right? There are no magic bullets. Like any type of dietary approach, it can be done, it could be done in, a, in a wrong way, it could be done in a right way, right? And that applies to a vegan diet, right? And this is something I really wanna to touch on too a lot is because I'm not gonna be a cheerleader for a particular uh, nutritional approach and not really talk about how to protect yourself from the pitfalls of that right so even if you know people view me as being a raw vegan or whatever the case is um, I can talk about all the benefits but I also have to talk about the ways that um, you can go about this the wrong way right so it's only responsible that we do so I posted a ver video earlier and maybe I'll show you guys uh, but I posted a video earlier and basically it was a video showing, I don't show too much of my current physique. I don't, I don't really, I don't identify as a bodybuilder. I'm a regular dude. I work out a few times a week. My workouts are around 20, 30 minutes, nothing crazy, right? I'm not trying to compete for anything or anything like that, but I want to stay in shape. You know, I want to have a good physique, musculature, be fairly lean and that's it, right? Um, but every once in a while, I'll show uh, my physique and I posted a video uh, on, here on the channel and on my Instagram of me just doing meal prep in the kitchen, right? And I have my back to the camera. You can see what my back looks like. Not to brag or boast, uh, but my back looks uh, pretty thick, right? It looks like a, tur a turtle shell, right? So we got some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle that's going on with the back muscle. Um, and, and, you know, no flexing or anything, just being regular, cutting up some cantaloupe. And the point is that I want to make is, I, I want to really touch on what actually builds muscle because most people who talk about uh, building muscle or pursuing building muscle don't really understand how muscle building actually works, right? So I'll start there. As a raw vegan, and I've talked about this before, one of the biggest mistakes that people make as a raw vegan is they under eat, right? Just not eating enough. Overeating is not really a problem that you'll have on a raw vegan diet. And the reason why is because it's not a toxic way of eating. Now, raw vegan just means that, you know, um, Either you don't eat any cooked foods or the amount of cooked foods you eat is marginal. So for example, uh, for me, I identify as a high raw vegan specifically. It's a type of raw vegan eating. So for me, I eat maybe one or two cooked meals a week. 
right? Or maybe like a, a couple cooked foods, right? Like for example, I'll eat broccoli or lentils. These are things that would have to either be steamed or boiled. But other than that, pretty much my entire diet is just whole food, raw foods, right? Um, it's mostly fruit by weight. That's, that's usually what my diet is. So the largest portion of my diet by weight or volume is going to be fruit, right? It's a large part uh, of my food intake, right? Now it varies from time to time depending on what I'm doing or what my goals are, right? Uh, and also what my budget is and what's available to me, from what I can get around, me, right? I'm a big fan of dietary planning. I think that you should plan for whatever you do. You go on vacation, you should plan. You want to get in shape, you want to train in the gym or at home, you should plan. You want to take a road trip, you should plan. You want to eat, you should plan. One of the benefits of being a fully grown adult is the fact that we can plan ahead of time and organize and follow a particular strategy or organized approach. Right? We're not children where we just run out the house, no keys, no wallet, fall down, scrape your knees, cry for a little bit, get up and run, do whatever. Just to, just one, just living one impulse to the next, right? As adults, you can't really cut it like this, right? So there is a resource in particular that I like to use when planning out nutrition. And this is Chronometer, right? So if you go to like a chronometer.com, C r o n o m e t e r dot com chronometer and you could essentially see not only the calories and macros of any given food but you can also see the macronutrient profile of any given food as well and so it's good to plug in your foods in that right and i can get into some of that on 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 the stream here tonight if i can open up a chronometer and give it, show y'all an example of that right but there are some things so for example like let's say you wanted to do a raw vegan diet but you weren't necessarily looking to lose weight or lose a lot of weight you wanted to maintain your weight so essentially what you should do is you should learn okay what is my bmr right what is your basal metabolic rate your basal metabolic rate is the amount of calories that you are guaranteed to burn on any given day it's very important to understand that with a raw vegan diet, um, you don't have to worry about, you know, getting obese or gaining all types of excessive fat, right? It's generally hard to do on a raw vegan diet, but it's pretty easy to maintain your muscle mass. Now, if you're a person with a high body fat percentage and you're losing a lot of weight, chances are you're dropping body fat right this could be the case and you're consistently dropping body fat and you don't really have much muscle mass underneath right so i've had people come to me well i'll have guys come to me and they're like five foot eight and they're like yeah i want to be i, I want I'm, i want to be around 200 pounds and they're like 185 pounds 23 percent body fat it's like, all right, you understand you're five foot eight. For you to be 200 pounds and five foot eight is, is ridiculous, right? When you to actually know what that looks like, that looks crazy. If you want to be like 200 pounds at five foot eight and you want to be lean, that is, that is physiologically incredible, right? That is freakish to be five foot eight and be that kind and be, have that kind of muscle mass as a fully adult male. And if you're a guy who's five foot eight and you're 185 pounds, uh, you know, 23% body fat, you understand if you drop down to like 10% body fat, you're gonna lose a lot of weight. So a lot of people don't really have an accurate sense of how much of their body weight is lean mass or what a, or what a good body weight is that they should be at. So if you're a guy who's like five foot eight, you should be in between let's say 150 to 165 pounds or so like that. If you're perhaps like anywhere from 5'9 to 5'11, you probably want to be somewhere around like 150 to 170 or something like that, right? The weights will vary from person to person. It really depends. Bone density, how wide your shoulders are, how wide your hips are, you know, this type of stuff, right? How big your feet are, your hands, etc. So your actual 
your your skeletal structure will determine how much muscle mass you can have on you at any given time. So it's very important to find out what your lean mass is. So basically your lean mass is your over your current body weight minus your body fat percentage. So when you subtract your body fat percentage, that's where you get your lean mass. Now that number can really fluctuate depending on how much glycogen you're storing with inside your skeletal muscle tissue. Typically for your average person, one kilogram of skeletal muscle tissue can hold like 15 uh, grams of glycogen. So basically you can take your skeletal muscle mass in weight and then multiply that by 15. And that'll give you a general idea of how much muscle glycogen storage as far as weight you can put on All right so it's important to know that so if you fully deplete your glycogen stores your weight can be significantly lower and then you replenish it you can actually gain about four or five pounds or something like that All right um and this can really swing your weight and the reason why is because for every one gram of glycogen which is basically glucose stored inside the skeletal inside the tissue cells as glycogen right glucose gets stored inside those cells and that storage is called glycogen right it's a cluster of glucose and for every gram of glycogen that is stored inside your lean tissue you will also store an additional three molecules or for every one molecule not gram for every one molecule of glycogen you will store three molecules of water so essentially glucose to water is a three to one ratio as far as to storage the reason why i bring this up is because when people talk about oh you're going to be frail and weak and skinny as a raw vegan a raw vegan diet generally is a high is a high carbohydrate diet right so for example if i eat one cantaloupe and that's like three to three and a half pounds that'll give me anywhere from 110 to like 125 grams of carbs if i eat let's say five bananas at around six six and a half inches or so that'll give me another 120 or 125 grams of carbs right so now i'm already in like above 200 something grams okay now in addition to that let's say i go and i have um let's say a cup and a half of rolled oats for like you know like a oat porridge like a overnight overnight oats like a raw um overnight oat porridge or something like that like what i like to do and i do a cup and a half that'll be another hundred something grams so with like each meal if you eat three meals a day that could be like 300 something grams of carbs if you eat four meals that could be like 400 something grams of carbs it's a lot of carbohydrates now the reason why this is significant generally is because if you're storing all that glycogen and water inside your muscle tissue this increases the volume of that muscle tissue so it would actually make your physique it'll enhance your physique it'll make you appear more muscular now getting into the dynamics of muscle tissue in and of itself right and i'm gonna get a little bit technical here but bear with me so you have it, your your muscles are generally made up of like these two components you have myofibular fibers right the actual muscle fibers and then you have sarcoplasm and the sarcoplasm is like the watery environment that surrounds the muscle fibers right so the sarcoplasm makes up the the volume of the muscle right so like let's say you go to the gym and you train a particular muscle let's say you get on the gym you do pec deck chest flies and you do a whole bunch of reps and really challenge the muscle and no your your actual chest muscles will increase in volume and size that is called sarcoplasmic hypertrophy right this is where the sarcoplasm of that muscle tissue is expanding right now this is a metabolic process this is a metabolic response because the the more the harder you push a muscle in this in this way where you, this is a metabolic stressor your muscle fiber your that muscle will respond to that metabolic stressor 
by increasing the, the, the volume of that muscle, the size of that muscle, increasing the glycogen of that muscle. So that muscle can now get more sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Now that's step one to how a muscle increases in size. So first you get sarcoplasmic hypertrophy in the short term. Secondly, the myofibrillar cells, those, those, those uh, muscle fibers, they get thicker and then your body creates more of those muscle fibers, right? And the sarcoplasm will decrease as the myofibrillar fibers increase. All right. So it's this undulation between sarcoplasm, sarcoplasm, myofibrillar fibers, right? One increases first, one increases second and causes the other to recede. And they go back and forth in your training, right? This is why you get a pump. You don't maintain it the whole entire time. It comes back down. And that, that, that pump will come back down because the metabolic stress is over with, right? That sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a relatively short term thing. Now, when you keep doing this process over and over and over, week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year, the muscle fibers and the sarcoplasm will keep increasing, right? And so this is just known as muscular hypertrophy. Now, it's not just the amount of water that increases, it's also the amount of glucose that can, that can get stored inside that muscle tissue as glycogen, right? And then what happens is when you eat carbohydrates, those carbohydrates break down into glucose and the proteins in those foods also break down into amino acids and that piggybacks into the cells. So those amino acids, the glucose and water gets shoved inside the muscle tissue, right? And then there's this beautiful hormone called insulin that facilitates that process and acts as a transportation mechanism. It also acts as a growth hormone. So a big part of hypertrophy is leveraging insulin to produce a growth response, right? Insulin is a growth hormone. When you eat carbohydrates, that triggers growth, right? So even like old school bodybuilders knew this, right? Like your Arnold Schwarzeneggers and even the ones before that. And so they would eat this. This is where the whole chicken and rice thing comes from, where it's like you're having just rice with every meal, right? It's like oats and rice and potatoes and sweet potatoes, sweet potato, oats and rice, right? That was, those were the, like the foods sweet potato oats and rice <laughs> right and then um you know with like chicken or something like that it was like chicken broccoli rice chicken sweet potato broccoli uh or like oats and sliced banana and you know that kind of thing it was a low fat diet right the conventional like tr tried and true bodybuilding diet literally was a high carb um moderate protein or even high protein low fat diet Right. That's what it always was, con what it conventionally was, because you want to leverage insulin and carbohydrates in order to increase muscle volume and facilitate what's called anabolism. Right. Or have the muscle in an anabolic state. Scientifically, the building up of, uh, of materials and tissues in your body is called anabolic and the breakdown is called catabolic training produces a catabolic state or catabolism and then the recovery from the training switches into anabolism or puts the body in an anabolic state now of course you can use food and you can leverage carbs and protein and insulin and whatnot to drive that process you don't really need that much protein and the reason why is because protein is a it's time it has time constraints on it right um, so it's better to get small amounts of protein with each meal or moderate amounts of protein with each meal with carbohydrates being the dominant factor. So generally speaking, you know, you're, you're looking at eating carbohydrates to protein at typically like a four to one. So for every, let's say for every four grams of carbs, you have one gram of protein or something like that, like conventionally speaking. With a raw vegan diet, it's going to be different, right? Because you're really hitting it with the carbohydrates because a raw vegan diet optimizes for, is optimized for longevity.
you can increase protein intake and have a bit better results as far as hypertrophy but it can eat it could eat into your training life this is the reason why a lot of bodybuilders uh professional bodybuilders they have to stop because they have they start having hormonal liver and kidney issues particularly kidney issues right so like a uh, liver and kidney detoxes are a big thing with experienced bodybuilders and that's because all of the processing of amino acids and things like that it's inflammatory on the kidneys after a while and so it starts causing problems this is a thing that happens over a period of five or ten years or so right it depends on how hard you go right and then of course whatever hormones and gear you're on as a bodybuilder i'm not talking about i'm not talking to bodybuilders here people who are like you know trying to go to the extreme but if you want to build muscle well then yeah carbohydrates are going to be the driving force now on a raw vegan diet it's not that hard to get protein not like people think i eat a raw vegan diet and basically on a raw vegan diet i'm good with like 60 to 80 grams of protein a day right the upper end could be like 100 grams or something like that but even that's a bit excessive right it's not really necessary it's not really any other benefit and then of course if protein is really a concern of yours it's just a peace of mind kind of thing you can do protein smoothies where you can add pea protein in a smoothie right um so you can do let's say if you want to have mango and you can do 20 ounces of mango and a couple scoops of you know naked pea protein or something like that with 8 to 16 ounces of blueberries and you know a couple tablespoons of you know hemp seeds and that's a ton of protein just in that one smoothie right there you can get nearly 40 grams of protein right uh, but it's not really particularly that necessary and then of course let's say you eat three and a half or you know four uh pounds of watermelon in the morning or something like that that's a good like 14 grams of protein right there from the watermelon and then let's say you add an ounce of let's say pumpkin seed kernels that's another six grams it's a significant amount of protein is definitely a significant amount of carbohydrates and water and the carbohydrates water and protein are catalysts for muscle growth right so the, the picture here scientifically biologically speaking a raw vegan diet is actually very advantageous to building lean muscle mass right so we get into certain micronutrients right because what happens when you combine a raw vegan diet with sun exposure which leads to vitamin d synthesis vitamin d it's called a vitamin but it's actually more of a hormone slash steroid or steroidal hormone so you get exposed to sun let's say you spend an hour in the sun spending an hour in the sun your body can synthesize like 10,000 ius of vitamin d it's just an hour of sun exposure right in some cases maybe even more than that so vitamin d does all types of things i mean it stimulates growth hormone bone density strengthens your immune system your gut reduces inflammation um vitamin d can also reduce and completely get rid of autoimmune disease so when people ask me about things like rheumatoid arthritis or ask me about what was the other one graves disease or hashimoto's yeah vitamin d is actually very significant with completely reversing these issues and then if you have an anti-inflammatory diet like a raw diet that would even further improve your results okay speaking of recovery i want to touch on a few micronutrients a few minerals and vitamins and things like that that are very important uh to the muscle building process i'm just talking about a raw vegan diet in terms of getting strength and building muscle mass and all of that right i'm talking about the science of it here right so i'm not even talking about anecdotes i don't want to focus too much on my personal anecdotes or anything just explaining the scientific mechanism there are important micronutrients i think the first one i can think about is magnesium 
magnesium is a cofactor in pretty much every hormonal process that happens in your body every metabolic process that happens in your body even the synthesis of vitamin d supplementation or otherwise requires magnesium as a currency even the shuttle calcium into your muscle tissue and your bone tissue that also requires magnesium magnesium is the universal currency for what facilitates all of these processes with just like five or six bananas i mean you can get like 30 percent of your vitamin d for the day you eat a cantaloupe that's another 50 percent or so right so just in between the cantaloupe and the in the bananas matter of fact let me double check let me put this in right quick i mean i, I want to make sure i'm speaking correctly i'm gonna plug it in right now so cantaloupe Let's say we do 48 ounces. That's typically one melon. How much is that? Okay, so basically 48 ounces of cantaloupe is 163 milligrams. So that's 39% uh, for me. Right, so not exactly 50% more along the lines of 40. Close enough. Now if I log the bananas. And I do five. So in between the three pounds of cantaloupe and the five bananas, that is already 226 grams of carbs, six, 17 grams of protein, four grams of fat, 912 calories. Just those two fruit. And as far as magnesium is concerned, that brings me up to 300 milligrams of magnesium. That's 71% for the day with the target goal being 420. All right. So when people talk about, oh, there's no protein and fruit and whatever, it's just sugar. Yeah, well, those two combined is 17 grams of protein. And that's just in the fruit. These are not high protein foods necessarily, but they're significant sources. Okay, potassium. Now, potassium is really important for blood flow, nervous system i mean potassium is a major electrolyte potassium is actually needed in order to alkalize your body in order to effectively uh conduct electrical energy that has implications for your nervous system your brain function your motor neurons producing strong muscular contractions so that potassium is a training aid to maximize training performance and muscle stimulation right Magnesium and potassium, very important for staying hydrated, blood flow, uh, as well as energy levels. Um, these are essential to preventing and reversing depression and anxiety, maintaining motivation levels, right? And all of that hinges on serotonin that is produced in the gut. And your serotonin is your happiness hormone. It allows you to feel happiness and pleasure and dopamine sensitivity, right? And dopamine allows you to be motivated because dopamine is a hormone that allows you to feel reward. So you see with these foods are extremely important, right? And even here with tryptophan, just these two foods right out the gate make up 20% of my tryptophan for the day, right? <clears throat> and then out of these two foods, I already got 29% of my zinc. Zinc is like the backbone of your dna right zinc is needed in order to create to, in order to synthesize in order to activate muscle protein synthesis right and although the fruits are not high uh, high zinc foods they even contain that zinc then there's copper now copper also very important for the health of your blood the production of hemoglobin which is the protein in your blood that helps to bind oxygen to your blood cells so that your blood can then utilize and absorb oxygen, right? And copper is essential to that whole entire process. People put this emphasis on iron and while iron is important, copper uh, is mandatory for the production of hemoglobin. When people have like a, like a low red blood cell count or where people talk about low iron, essentially, if you want to raise your iron, you need more copper and vitamin C in your diet. And speaking of vitamin C, we've got 604% of vitamin C here. And then for iron, we got 52%. All right. 
manganese is necessary for the repair and recovery of your nervous system this allows you to be able to engage in intense training in the gym manganese is also extremely important for for healing and rebuilding connective tissues tendons ligaments right this type of thing so manganese very important manganese also is a key alkalizing mineral all right and then vitamin a vitamin a is essential to testosterone production that vitamin a largely is coming from that cantaloupe right so you're getting about 256 percent of the vitamin a uh, really, it's not vitamin A that you're getting from the cantaloupe, it's beta carotene. And beta carotene um, is then used by your body to produce vitamin A. Right? So vitamin A is made inside your body. Folate. Folate is extremely important to brain health, recovery, sleep quality, having healthy thyroid function, everything. Right? folate is needed to break down histamines and all types of stuff right folate is essential to fat metabolism all kinds of stuff mental health etc folate is a huge deal and one of the biggest benefits to having a high carbohydrate diet is the folate folate allows you to get good sleep quality folate allows you to grow hair skin nails muscle tissue all types of stuff right folate is huge hormonal balance I mean, you name it <clears throat> right and then we've got vitamin b6 pyridoxine right 218 percent also extremely important for hormonal balance nervous system recovery and i keep stressing the nervous system recovery thing because your b vitamins are largely responsible for the maintenance and rejuvenation of your nervous system and your nervous system infrastructure you want to protect that because all of this hormonal signaling if you want to build muscle if you want to burn body fat if you want to sleep if you want to wake up if you want to feel happy if you want to have libido anything your nervous system is responsible for all of that communication right so this is a big deal here thymine thymine is another one thymine is necessary uh for the production of why am i blanking on it right now your body's natural antioxidant glutathione okay um so thymine is necessary for uh things like anti-aging recovery uh protecting uh your, your neurological health right um thymine is like anti-cancer all types of stuff um thymine is like anti-fibroid all types of stuff thymine is a big deal but anyways i'm not going to go through every single micronutrient here but the last one i'll probably go through here is omega-3 essential fatty acids just with these two fruits that i named this is already 48 percent okay 48 percent of omega-3 essential fatty acids also very important for brain health I keep stressing the brain health thing with the B vitamins and the alkalizing minerals and the omega threes and the tryptophan and all of this type of stuff, the vitamin A, the hormonal balance, etc. The reason why I'm I'm really putting an emphasis on this is because muscle building is largely dictated by mental health. You can't really effectively build muscle and get stronger without maintaining optimal mental health matter of fact your mental health is a reflection of nervous system recovery if you have a history of training intensely right you go hard in the gym you train intensely let's say you lift heavy weights you're getting a barbell you're squatting deadlifting bench pressing overhead pressing snatching cleaning jerking push pressing farmers carriers you're doing the big the, the, the big adult stuff right the big boy stuff the big girl stuff going hard right the crossfit the power lifting all of this type of stuff if you train real hard and you under recover your mental health will erode it will decline over time your sleep quality will plummet into the ground you might develop insomnia heart palpitations 
you might get blurry vision, lose your motivation, even lose your appetite, or have low impulse control and start binge eating, uh, start skipping training days in the gym, start struggling with behaving rationally. You might adre uh, develop adrenal fatigue, extraordinarily high cortisol levels. You might start gaining excess body fat, like belly fat out of nowhere. Your libido crash into the ground. All these things, all of these things are related to your nervous system recovery and your mental health is a demonstration of that. So if you want to know if your nervous system is recovering, check in on your mental health and that will show you where you're at okay it's an indicator of what's going on if you have a blood sugar monitor this would this could be demonstrated in your cortisol levels where you wake up first thing in the morning if your blood sugar is really high first thing in the morning even though you haven't eaten anything that's the sign that's a sign of insulin resistance and high cortisol levels as a result of just perpetually not just constantly not recovering effectively that's why the B vitamins and all the all those micronutrients I mentioned are so important. All right. One thing I want to make it a point to do is when I get on these streams and I talk to y'all, I get granular about the technicalities of nutrition, training, and I go through all the nerdiness of the micronutrients that are found in the foods and all of that. It's because I, I you know, I really want you to understand. A lot of people talk about nutrition and stuff on the internet but they're not naming the particular micronutrients in the food, right? So I want you to know what nutrients are in what foods and why it's important. So now you're gonna have a deeper understanding of things like cantaloupe and banana, for example, right? And already just within those two meals, that's already 912 calories. Now, let's say we wanted to add more omega-6 essential fatty acids to your diet because uh, we wanted extra zinc, we wanted extra selenium, we wanted extra iron, right? Things like this, right? And we wanted to get that full amino acid profile. So let's do this. Let's say we add an ounce of Brazil nuts, just an ounce, just one ounce. So now let's say we do that. That brings us up to 1,099 calories, 230 grams of carbs, 21 grams of protein, and 23 grams of fat, right? And now what that does is that brings our selenium up, way up. Selenium is really important for um, testosterone production. It's, it's, it's essential to muscle protein synthesis, the recovery of your nervous system, that type of thing. Now this, it, it, the interesting thing about the Brazil nuts and an ounce of Brazil nuts, one ounce of Brazil nuts is roughly 10 Brazil nuts. Okay. Now, selenium toxicity is a real thing, but the caveat is it only really seems to be a thing that can be achieved through supplementation of selenium. This doesn't seem to really be applied to foods. And I've looked for the evidence to demonstrate selenium toxicity from Brazil nuts. Haven't seen any data that produced that yet. Um, and I've gone through long stretches of time. I'm talking months eating an ounce of Brazil nuts a day, right? Um, and haven't had any issues. And I put it in diet plans with other people and they've only had positive results from doing it. So this, I, I don't know if there's really a substantial risk there with that. Now, if you didn't want to do that, maybe you just wanted to do it once a week. You just do the Brazil nuts an ounce for maybe once or twice a week or something like that, you can do that. If you if you'd rather just do two Brazil nuts, you can do that too, right? So it's up to your discretion. Now let's add another one, right? Because it's a good idea to have the nuts or the seeds with your, your fruit, right? People talk about eating seeded fruit. So what about having nuts or seeds with your fruit? Some people have this religious... Uh, uh, belief that you shouldn't eat nut, uh, eat nuts or seeds with fruit, but well, that kind of gets overridden when you deal with the fact that people advocate for eating watermelon loaded with seeds. <laughs> but in any case, let's say we do one ounce of pumpkin seed kernels. Let's say we do dry roasted pumpkin seed kernels, right? 
So that now brings us to 1262, 29 grams of protein, 234 grams of carbs, 37 grams of fat. Okay. Now this brings our riboflavin up. That brings our thymine up even more. This brings our iron up even more. Um, and this brings our zinc up. So now we have a total of six and a half milligrams of zinc. That's half of our uh, of our zinc for the day. We we reach our hundred percent of methionine and a phenylalanine, right? Getting granular here. And then omega-6 essential fatty acids, we're at 77% of that and 50% for omega-3s. Now you see here right out the gate, it's not that hard to eat enough. One of the biggest problems with people on a raw vegan diet is they they significantly under eat, right? So you have people and they be doing a raw vegan diet. They're like, oh, I have like two bananas and a cup of coconut yogurt. And I'm like, two bananas? Oh, yeah, I'll have like a little bowl of cantaloupe. A little bowl of cantaloupe? How many pounds? I'll ask people who are like doing a raw vegan diet, how many pounds of fruit are you eating in a sitting? They're like, pounds? Oh, I don't know. You're not eating enough. Because you can eat pounds of fruit at a time, right? Like eat like each meal of fruit can be like three pounds of fruit, four pounds of fruit at a time. Right? Now... A raw vegan diet is more so a health first. Uh, it's a it's a high energy diet. It's very important to understand that it's a high energy diet. This is very important for things like mental health, because guess what? If you have an abundance of energy in your diet, that will significantly improve your mental health. Right. I've had a lot. Of, I have a I have a hundred percent success rate with helping people who deal with chronic anxiety and depression to get off of their medications. I feel very confident in saying that, 100% success rate. The caveat is you have to actually follow the plan for it to work. <laughs> I've had people come to me with that issue and I give them the plan, they don't follow it so it doesn't work. But those who follow it, it definitely works, right? Improving your mental health significantly. What I do have to say is you still, if you have low vitamin D, it's not going to fix that issue. The only, because if your mental health issues are coming from a lack of vitamin D, you got to get that sun exposure. Even supplementation and high dosages may not be enough, right? Because you may have some type of uh, oxidation. You may have some type of damage to your liver that can be impeding uh, the conversion rate of vitamin D in your liver, right? So you can be taking vitamin D3 in a supplement form, but that vitamin D3 has to be converted into D25 hydroxy, right, in your liver. And that is the active form of vitamin D that your body actually uses, right? So you can supplement with vitamin D, but you should also make sure you get outside, spend more time outside. So that high energy raw vegan diet, it'll get you there. It'll get you pretty close to the finish line, but it's not a magic bullet. It's a massive source of leverage, but it is not the cure-all, right? We have to have a holistic approach to health. But the significance of having a high energy diet is because the process of muscle building is a high, is a high energy process. In order to create new cells, new metabolically active muscle tissue, that requires a lot of energy. The process of creating new muscle takes a lot of energy. And then the process of maintaining muscle tissue requires a lot of energy. And going back to the whole sarcoplasm and the environment and the alkalinity and the muscle and, and all of this type of stuff and the metabolic process, muscle is very metabolically active. So having those carbohydrates is a way of ensuring that your muscle tissue is not hemorrhaging amino acids and it's not getting dehydrated and then getting into a catabolic state. One thing about a raw vegan diet, it is a very water rich dry diet. There really isn't any like dry carbohydrates. Dr I'm not a fan of dry carbohydrates. Uh, you don't want dry carbs, right? Dry carbs generally are bad. Dry carbs are like processed foods, crackers, cookies, right? Things of this nature. These carbohydrates are a bit of a strain for your body to use right you want your carbohydrates to contain water 
right? So like, for example, I put oats in a diet plan, but the oats are pre-soaked, right? So you submerge the oats in water and the oats suck up the water. And then you take that, those oats. And when you eat those oats, it's the carbs from the oats, but also a tremendous amount of water so that those carbohydrates are, are primed to be used by your body for energy, right? Your intestines, your digestive tract can more easily pull nutrients from that food, right? So the food needs to be hydrated so that the cell walls of the food can open up and then your body can then absorb nutrients from the, from the, from that food, whatever that food may be, right? This is why we don't eat dry lentils. We don't eat dry beans, this type of thing. And I'm a big fan of kasha and kasha is like toasted buckwheat. It's like these little tiny growths. But then when you submerge them in water and you soak them over time, they blow up to be like four times their size. It's phenomenal, right? And that's one of my favorite foods to actually put in a raw plant. So even though, you know, I have like more of a fruitarian approach to a raw diet, it doesn't mean that you only eat fruit and nothing else, right? There's a spectrum. Depends on what your goals are, right? But your oats and your kasha, this is where you're going to have more protein or so in your diet. This is where you're going to have more selenium from these foods. You're going to have more zinc from these foods in your diet, that kind of thing. Right? So if I go here and going back to chronometer and I'm going to type in, I should be sharing this on my screen, but just, just going off the cuff here. So if I type in old fashioned rolled oats and I do a cup and a half, and this is just me. I'm now up to 1,832 calories, 333 grams of carbs, 47 grams of protein, 46 grams of fat, right? So this is 69% carbs, 22% fat, 10% protein, right? Um, having a low protein diet could be a very valuable thing to do if you're dealing with chronic inflammation uh, and kidney disease. Uh, like a, a high energy, low protein food uh, diet can actually be very beneficial if you're dealing with kidney issues, right? Or if you're dealing with like IBS, like irritable bowel, some type of leaky gut issues, right? So now this pretty much brings up the thymine now to 131%. It brings up niacin. Niacin is a big deal for blood flow as well, right? Vascular dilation. Niacin is often put into uh, pre-workouts, energy drinks. Energy drinks are loaded with B vitamins, right? Because caffeine in and of itself is not where you really get that, that energy from and that vasodilation, that extra blood flow. You get it from the B vitamins. So that brings the niacin up to 102%, the B6, that brings that up to 99%, B, uh, B5, B5 is 99%, and then the B6, that pyridoxine, 253%, right? Uh, and then, so basically everything here is, is in the green, copper, iron, I just reached everything by adding in those oats. I haven't even added in the leafy greens yet. Right. And the zinc, the zinc is now up to 11.8 milligrams, basically 12 milligrams. Right. Generally speaking, um, a man should be getting anywhere from 10 to 12 grams of zinc per day. Right. That's like a general recommendation. So definitely reach that here. Okay. Now. Let's say one meal is the cantaloupe and the Brazil nuts. Another meal is the bananas and the pumpkin seed kernels. And then a third meal can be the oats, right? Now, with that oats, we can add some things to that oats. So let's say with those oats, we add hemp seeds. So if I do hold hemp seeds and I do two tablespoons of hemp seeds, that now brings me up to 1,942 calories, which is 334 grams of carbs. 56 grams of fat and 54 grams of protein protein is still at 10 percent carbs are at 65 percent fats are at 25 percent none of this is cooked foods by the way right the omega-3 essential fatty acids coming from the hemp seeds now bring the omega-3s up to 175 percent omega-6s are 129 percent and now my zinc is at 13.7 so pretty much like 14 milligrams right 
So that's that's capping off that third meal. Now, if I wanted to add blueberries to that, I wanted to top. I wanted to top that uh, the oats with the hemp seeds. I wanted to top that off with blueberries, right? I want to add some fruit to that meal. I would do eight ounces, and that brings me up to two thousand seven hundred and twenty. Uh, sorry, two thousand seventy-two calories, right? Twenty seventy-two. 367 grams of carbs, 55 grams of protein, and 56 grams of fat. All right. So carbs still 67%, so a little bit higher now. Protein is still at that 10%. Fats dropped down a couple points, now at 23%. The blueberries now bring my vitamin K up. So now my vitamin K is at 70, 71%. Interestingly enough, vitamin K... You get vitamin K1 from foods, and then basically the vitamin K1 is converted into vitamin K2 in your gut. Your body makes its own vitamin K, right? Vitamin K is a postbiotic that is produced by your gut microbiome, okay? So having a diet that nourishes and feeds your beneficial gut bacteria in your gut, that is going to help you to get adequate amounts of things like uh b12 vitamin k vitamin a short chain fatty acids things of this nature right so those postbiotics is just another reason why a raw vegan diet would be very advantageous okay now let's say now here i didn't i didn't i didn't uh, i didn't add greens green leafy vegetables so let's say we wanted to do a salad right if we wanted to add a salad here, let's say we did, uh, let's do kale. Matter of fact, let's do spinach. Let's do that. We'll do four cups of spinach. And we'll do, let's say cucumber. Let's say we get an eight inch cucumber and we'll do uh, one large cucumber. All right, and then let's say we do what else could we add to that, you think? Uh, maybe we can add an ounce of pistachios to it. Let's say we do that. Let's say we add an ounce of pistachios without the shell. And then we add, let's say we add an avocado. Okay. So now we just added that. So now that brings us to 2,533 calories in four meals. You see what I mean about the under eating thing? Because if you're... If you're a person who's under eating, you're probably looking at this right now. What I'm saying, you're not looking at it because I'm not sharing this on my screen. I would have to do a whole setup with that. But basically, you're probably like, oh, wow, I've been massively under eating. Now, if you can't build muscle eating 2,533 calories, <laughs> right, this is not where you're just going to be hemorrhaging weight and just starving away and dying. That's not what's going to happen if you're eating like this with these four meals. This is 402 grams of carbs, okay? 91 grams of fat, 69 grams of protein. We're dealing with high energy here, okay? So now the vitamin K with that salad now goes up to 622%. Vitamin E is at 73%, right? Vitamin E is coming from that avocado, the leafy greens, the pistachios, things like that, right? Uh, vitamin E, I wouldn't worry about too much because your body accumulates vitamin E over time. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. You don't really need a whole lot of it at a time. Okay. Um, and you don't need... We're at 50% calcium. We don't need a whole lot of calcium in the diet, uh, especially uh, if we're trying to reduce risk of things like uh, stone formation, right? Uh, kidney stones, gallstones, that kind of thing. People are getting too much calcium in their diet, right? You have people who fear monger about like oxalates. Oh, you know, the problem with a raw or plant-based diet or a raw vegan diet, oh, the oxalates, right? Oh, the oxalates, they form crystals and calcification, oh, right? Well, the calcium here is pretty marginal, right? And that significantly reduces the chances of, you know, crystallized formation or calcification or uh, the contribution to atherosclerotic plaque buildup. And in fact, this type of dietary approach is very beneficial to reversing atherosclerosis. Right? 
uh so all of the foods here that i just mentioned these go a long way towards uh improving cardiovascular health hormonal stability liver health kidney health pancreatic function thyroid health all of that you name it right so four meals real simple um and you can really eat in abundance okay now you may say oh well is that really enough protein well yes it is so I always say, and I probably say this like every stream, nutrition is a, or human health is a zero sum game, which means more of one thing is necessarily less of another, right? So even if it's a diet that doesn't have, let's say it doesn't have as, that much protein and it doesn't have that much calcium in it. Well, that's offset by the amount of magnesium and potassium and how much, how much of a reduction in inflammation there is. If you increase your levels of thymine, your levels of folate, your levels of potassium, your carbohydrate intake, your water intake, if you increase that in your diet, this reduces the levels of inflammation, uh, the levels of oxidative stress in your body, because these things are protective. And these are foods that are loaded with antioxidants. So even when it comes to something like training in the gym, if you're eating this way, inflammation is very tightly regulated so this reduces the instances of joint pain excessive muscle soreness you know fatigue and all this type of stuff right and if you're keeping your muscle glycogen stores full well you're maintaining this anabolic environment in your muscle and you're accelerating recovery and then with all the extra zinc and magnesium in your diet here eating like this for example that's going to go a long way towards muscle repair, sleep quality, hormonal balance, reduction in inflammation, improving kidney function, liver function, thyroid function, adrenal function, pituitary function, cardiovascular function. This will also reduce uh, the potential for things like edema, neuropathy, etc. because of the B vitamins and the hydration, right? Um... In these foods alone, this is 62% of water and just the foods here. So this is, what does that say? 2,300 grams of water. Very water rich diet, right? And that's not including things like drinking tea or chlorophyll water, things like that. So getting kind of granular tonight talking about food selection right and giving an example of how to eat to build muscle and recovery and all of this kind of stuff let me see if i can do this here right quick hold on i'm gonna do let me see if i can show you all this this is my jam Oh, I know a better way to do it. Hold on. Hold on. Give me one sec. Check this out. I'm going to show you all this. Go here. Shrink myself down a little bit in the corner. Boom. There we go. So this is basically what it looks like here in chronometer. So you see this is chronometer.com. This is a list of all the foods. This is the back end here. So this is a list of all the foods. You can plug in your Fitbit, your scale to get your biometrics, right? You can get your calorie and macro goals and whatnot set up. It shows you your calories and macros, all of that. It shows your micronutrient targets. See, that's at 90%. Uh, if I wanted to hit that 100%, I could do things like add water. Uh, I could add a vitamin D supplement and calcium. I'm not really interested in adding extra calcium. I'm not really interested in adding extra sodium either. The sodium could be covered here really easily by adding a quarter teaspoon of sodium to the, uh, adding a quarter teaspoon of sea salt or Celtic salt to, to the oats, right? And that would have that covered. Now here you see the full amino, all of the amino acids here. 
So all of my branch chain amino acids and all of that are fully covered here. So even for me, right, at my current measurements, that's 69 or 70 grams of protein that we have in this diet plan right here. This is enough amino acids. This is enough protein. I hit all of my amino acid levels. So this is what I mean by people really overestimate the amount of protein they need, right? So this, when you have this amino acid breakdown here, you really get to see what's what. And then the red is basically <laughs> where you're getting way over. So this manganese is up to like over 500%. The selenium is like over a thousand percent. Um, and then energy, right? 122%, right? So I'm like 22% over or whatever the case is. Right. So, um, by the way, I also do live meal planning and get a little bit grandier like this too with tribe members. All right. So all the, all y'all tribe members, y'all know how we get down. We get in the voice chat and the discord right we do meal planning we do talking about training mindset and all of that kind of stuff we do that every 8 p.m eastern thursday thursday 8 p.m eastern uh if y'all want to become a tribe member you want access to my training plans my high raw vegan nutrition guide my fasting courses you want to get in on our member exclusive streams um you can definitely uh hit the link in the description of this video um and sign up for the 12 week mentorship, right? So that's in the hit the 12 week mentorship, or you can book a call with me if you just want to get on a call. Hey, these are the issues I'm dealing with. Uh, you know, I need answers or I need some help or point me in the right direction of what I need to do. So you can book a call with me and do that as well. I got some availability, uh, for, well, do I have availability for this week? I got a couple slots open for this, for this week, but I think only two, it looks like I only have two slots open for this week. So if you want to book a call with me, I got fr for this week, I have Friday, I have one slot for Friday and one slot for Saturday open. And then my week is closed out and you'd have to book for next week. So if you want to do that, um, definitely, definitely jump on for next week because it's Monday and the schedule fills quick. All right, y'all. So, uh, and you can do, you can uh, sign up for both of those, the call or the 12 week mentorship uh, in the link in the description of this video. All right. So yeah, basically, you know, when it comes to being a weak, frail vegan, if you're eating this way, you won't be. Okay. And then of course you can modify the food portions. You can add meals or whatever the case is. If for whatever reason you need more food, uh, if you feel like you need more protein, you can add a smoothie, right? With some protein powder and do that. Right. So if you're really serious, you're a bodybuilder, you're trying to get jacked. You're trying to get swole, right? You're trying to look like a, you, you want your arms to look like bratwurst sausages, right? Ladies, you want horse glutes, right? You want some big old thick glutes, glutes. And yeah, definitely, you, know, you can always add in a protein smoothie and throw some extra fruits in there. Bananas, strawberries, mangoes, things like that in there. So yeah, you adjust accordingly. All right, so there's a plan for everything. You just have to know to plan in advance. <clears throat> what else do I want to bring up about a raw vegan diet? I've spent a lot of time on this. I, th I think I got pretty deep tonight. I think I got, I think I covered it. I think we did it. Put a W in the chat if I covered it all tonight, as far as, as, far as uh, building muscle on a raw diet and you know all of that type of stuff. If I addressed the, the frail thing. I'm gonna have to follow this up with a training video too to talk about training strategies because the thing that builds muscle is not really diet necessarily, it's your training. The thing that's going to have the heaviest influence over whether you gain muscle or not is gonna be how you train. You can, your diet can be A1, 100% solid, but if your training strategy sucks and you're under recovering, then no, it's not gonna cut it. You know what's funny is people trying to lose weight, they cut their food intake too much. And then the people who are trying to build muscle, they eat too much and they train too much. And they under recover. 
So when you eat like crazy and you train like crazy, but you under recover, you just end up putting on more body fat and you just feel like crap and tired and exhausted. And then, you know, you start running into motivation issues, <laughs> right? These are the, probably like the biggest pitfalls that people run into. All right, let me catch up with y'all in these comments here. Hey, we definitely need a training overview. Oh yeah. Hey, let me tell you something. I've been doing, I've been live streaming weekly for years, right? I was doing it on TikTok. I was doing it on, then I switched to YouTube, but you know, pretty much that's my jam. I was doing it on Facebook. Cause there's, there's always something to talk about. There's always something to, there's, there's always some knowledge. There's always some game to kick here. <laughs> Not the horse glutes. That's right. Big old, thick, strong, durable glutes. That's right. Your, your glutes is your largest muscle in your body. Them, they better be strong. You can't have weak glutes. That's, that's that's like your largest muscle in your body. You can't have that. Cali girl, what's going on? Good to see you in here. Life changing consultation call. Do it. True. Look at that. We got a we got an official endorsement. All right, book a call with me. Cause Cali girl says so. Absolutely. Miss Idri, what's going on? Good to see you. Coach Remsen is hitting it out the ballpark with the nutrition education. True. That's right. Big shout out to you because you getting the waist snatched. You know what I'm saying? Dropping the body fat, building the muscle. You're getting everything you came for. So definitely big shout out to you. Absolutely. Oats is so controversial. Dictors on both sides of good or bad. You mean doctors? I think you mean doctors. Um, I mean, oats are not really controversial, I don't think. I haven't seen any evidence that shows that. People, you know what it is, people make all kind of BS claims about oats, you know. I've heard things like phytates, all oh, the phytic acid, blah, 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 right? Well, we're not eating dry oats straight out the container, right? That's not what we're doing, so it doesn't count. People say all kind of stuff. Oh, you should avoid eating beans because lectins. It's like, well, we're not eating dry beans, right? We're not just going into a, reaching into a bag full of dry beans and taking out a handful of dry beans and just eating them like Skittles. We don't do that, right? So it doesn't, <laughs> this is why we, this, this is why we do things like soaking and boiling, etc. right? Micah Walker, I have a call with you tomorrow afternoon. There we go. I saw you on there. That's right. I'm looking forward to it. That's right. Thank you for your attention to detail. Oh, yeah. We get granular. We get granular. Yep. Overtraining will raise your cortisol and slow or even stop your progress too much of anything ain't good for you true if you are natural in the gym training and trying to build muscle just understand zero sum zero sum more of one thing is necessarily less of another so more the more you train the less time you have to recover it is zero sum Right, so choose your choose how you spend your time wisely. Didn't realize cantaloupe was so nutritious. I don't like it, but it looks like I'll have to start. Eat. You don't like cantaloupe, Lord? What do you mean you don't like cantaloupe? We gonna have to have, we gonna have to have a conversation. You don't like cantaloupe? That's crazy. Uh, let's see. How is this done financially? Oh, financially, it's amazing. You save your money on your medical bills. <laughs> no, so I don't. I can't speak to the prices where everybody is, but I know for me, I can get a cantaloupe for like a few dollars, like three dollars and change, something like that. So if I eat like, I alternate between cantaloupe and honeydew. So I'll do like a cantaloupe one day and a honeydew the next. And they're around like three dollars. It's three dollars a change or so. Um, in my experience, you save money when eating like this, right? 
Um, and then, of course, with the oats, if you buy them in bulk, you know, that's that that's a that's a pretty cheap food. Kasha also, right? That toasted buckwheat, you're implementing that, you save money on that as well. See, it's not as expensive as people may think. Uh, so yeah, basically, and I know somebody asked me about, um, somebody asked me about Graves disease. I think I answered that, but basically just to touch back on that, uh, can, can you eat on a raw vegan diet with that issue? Yes. Right. When it comes to any type of issue like that or autoimmune disease, things like this, stress management is key. And remember, when I was talking about the B vitamins and the magnesium and the vitamin C and all the antioxidants, and I was given all the details about the micronutrients in the food, the omega-3s and all of that, right? That's stress management. All of these foods improving your, your sleep quality and all that, stress management, right? So when you improve your stress levels, when you get more vitamin D, those go a long way towards reversing autoimmune issues. I've had people reverse lupus. I've had people uh, reverse Hashimoto's. I've had people reverse PCOS. I've had people where they lost their menstrual cycle for, like a, for nearly a year and they got it back. And they were like, oh my God, I got my menstrual cycle back. I want to have a kid. Life-changing stuff. It's heavy. Cancer. I've had people beat cancer. Big deal. Crohn's. Colitis. I've had people combat those issues where they no longer have all this gut inflammation. Right. I've had um, I've had uh, people where they've had. Um, what is that? They kept having gallstones, gallbladder inflammation. This one lady, it's a phenomenal story. She reached out to me. She booked a call with me. She had already scheduled a surgery to get her gallbladder removed. She had the call with me first, but she already had the surgery scheduled. But the, having the call with me is like a Hail Mary for her exhausting her options. I told her, I said, don't get your gallbladder removed. Here's what we're gonna do. Put her on a diet plan. And within a matter of weeks, I think like the first four weeks, she dropped weight, no more stones, no more gallbladder inflammation, no more digestive issues, none of that. Didn't need to get rid of her gallbladder. She had insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, uh, fatty liver. She had acid reflux, like really chronic acid reflux, all types of issues. And it was starting to affect her kidneys. 12 weeks in, no issues, clean slate. Heavy stuff. Got all kinds of stories like that. Danielle, I have a consultation book for tomorrow. There we go. Look, there, there we go. That's right. Look at that. I got two calls for tomorrow and y'all both in the stream tonight. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> got a little community event going on here tonight. Bananas $1.99, grapes $2.99, oranges three pounds for $4.99. That's right. We got deals. We've got deals. Absolutely. Big shout out to, to you, John Green. Welcome back to the stream tonight. Can you please do a session explaining why the sugar from fruit won't hurt you? I keep telling my family they don't believe me. Yes, yeah, so I got to do a diabetes stream covering diabetes. Um, Diabetes, right? What can I say about the difference? So what is the difference between the sugar and like, I don't know, processed foods and the sugar and fruit? 
oops so we go back to that zero sum thing again right so when it comes to fruit versus like you know let's say processed foods like uh, um pizza donuts cookies whatever the case is fruits are not high carb and high fat right um also fruits are not dry right so your processed foods your cookies donuts pizzas th these are dry fatty foods with a garbage micronutrient profile and no fiber so no magnesium no manganese no potassium no water no prebiotic fiber it's got all of these key components that are needed in a food that's missing so in for for blood sugar control why do fruits work so well for blood sugar control well fruits let's take watermelon watermelon contains a tremendous amount of vitamin c vitamin c regulates blood sugar absorption right um vitamin c is also an antioxidant it reduces stress in the body in general right um so vitamin c will combine or work as a cofactor with glycogen to energize your cells vitamin c helps to improve insulin sensitivity watermelon is also a rich source of b vitamins and that helps with uh, mitochondrial function vitamin c does also so the b vitamins essentially what they do is they ramp up mitochondrial function so oxygen uptake increases in atp production adenosine triphosphate inside your cells that process ramps up so like if you eat watermelon pretty habitually essentially what happens is if you had brain fog gone right sluggishness gone poor sleep gone you get more mental alertness you get better cognitive function you get better muscular contractions you get better libido you get better everything better blood flow all of this kind of stuff right and it's like 80 percent water on top of that so you don't got so this is a hydrating food and one of the best things that you can do if you're a person who's insulin resistant or diabetic is have a hydrating diet or just be hydrated in general dehydration is a significant uh, contributing factor to uh diabetes or insulin resistance okay your metabolism will get crushed under the weight of dehydration it's a serious problem and in fact one of the most serious problems that people have on like a carnivore diet for example which is all the rage these days is heart palpitations and insomnia and that is because of the chronic dehydration the significant lack of folate and magnesium and potassium right and that produces vascular constriction and your body picks up on this ramps up your blood pressure right to try to get more nutrients and more energy to the cells quicker right um and this can lead to neuropathy that's another one so cramps muscle spasms uh heart palpitations all of that right and that can raise your high that can raise your blood pressure make you more insulin resistant etc wrecks your metabolism dehydration right and of course if you cut all your carbohydrates well then the glycogen isn't being stored inside your cells at an optimal rate right and that glycogen gets stored inside your cells at that three to one ratio so basically a lack of glycogen storage equals a lack of water storage leads to dehydration etc and then you get hitches in the atp production inside your cells so something like watermelon in, it, it reverses all of that then watermelon has this beautiful amino acid in it called citrulline which is a precursor to arginine which is which your body then uses to produce nitric oxide and nitric oxide causes vascular dilation so this is very beneficial for people who are diabetic and people with high blood pressure and people who are diabetic usually have high blood pressure and so when you have the vitamin c and the b vitamins and the water and the citrulline and the increased nitric oxide that helps to regulate and improve uh insulin sensitivity blood sugar blood pressure liver function etc everything improves and then mitochondrial function becomes optimized this has significant benefits to your thyroid 
and thus your pituitary gland, right? So it has all these kind of benefits that go straight up the chain. And then as well as the potassium and you know all that type of stuff, right? So with the fruits, you can't look at fruits as just being this these sugar balls. They all the only thing that's in it is sugar. It's not true. Fruits are loaded with all kinds of beneficial things. Uh, you know, zeaxanth zeaxanthin, lecithin, uh, lutein. I mean, carotenoids, I mean, all types of stuff, all these chemical compounds. I can just keep naming stuff. I'll be here all day explaining what everything does. <laughs> Malic acid, which improves uh, intestinal health. If you're having gut health issues, if you're having uh, GERD, if you're having IBS, Crohn's, colitis, malic acid, extremely important, right? Um, and you can find that in things like grapes, watermelon, pineapple, apples, any kind of citrus fruits, right? Uh, this type of thing. Uh, boron, apple pectin, which is uh, phenomenal for your gut health, right? The, the, the fiber that is found in foods, these are prebiotic fibers that act as a food source for your gut health. All of this is beneficial to, di to diabetics in all kinds of different ways, right? Uh, essentially, diabetes is a result of insulin resistance where basically glucose uptake is inhibited as a result of chronic inflammation producing that is produced by a traffic jam in your mitochondria. Right? It's often a result of a lack of vitamin D, a lack of magnesium, chronic dehydration, excess salt to potassium ratio, all these different things. So fruit helps to reverse a lot of that. All right. That's right. Sad diet is killing folks. That's right. And it's sad. All right. So now what to do if I've already had my gallbladder removed? Well, if you've already had your gallbladder removed, um, having a high carb, low fat diet where your fats generally in between 10 to 15% it becomes ideal, right? So it, you can actually still get everything you came for, but you'd have to structure your diet in a bit of a different way. So fruits, very beneficial if you don't have a gallbladder, uh, as well as things like sweet potato, butternut squash, red lentils, kasha, oats, a variety of berries right different things like that mangoes etc right so you can still have an energy rich muscle building diet even if you don't have a gallbladder um and a, a raw diet or a high raw diet would particularly be very beneficial to you but will what will give you problems is having too much dietary fat and having too much protein in your diet because your gut doesn't have the ability uh, to produce the necessary stomach acids to break those things down. All right. Uh, request to share more raw Indian. <laughs> I know you always ask me this. I actually have to do research to find out all of the different foods that are in India, for example. I'm not very familiar with what foods are all in India. So I've, I've given you a lot of suggestions already, but, um, I am pretty ignorant about what foods are available in India, I will say. I got a lot of learning to do on that front. Alright, I have to look at it again and take more notes. I don't know what that's referring to. I'm two years fully raw high fruit, two years. I'm having issues maintaining appetite, causing me to under eat. Is high raw better for this issue or will switching to cooked foods cause issues? I think high raw could be a good adjustment. Um, but if you're, <clears throat> if you're losing your appetite and, and, and it's causing you to under eat, we'd have to explore the reason of, we have, we'd have to explore what's causing you to lose your appetite. So there can be some, some, there can be some tweaks that can be made to your diet. So for example, I am a big fan of a fruit, a fruit based raw vegan diet, but 
I am not really a believer in just like removing all of your fats from your diet and just straight carbs only with no overt fats. I'm not, I don't really feel comfortable with that. It can be very beneficial short term, but doing it over a very extended period of time, like a year or even more, eh, you can run into problems doing that, right? I don't think you should swear. Off, I, th I think it's a bad idea generally to swear off anything that isn't a fruit right i think you should leverage everything that could be beneficial to you within your ethical framework and which you know things that you can get the most amount of benefit from with the least amount of downside so this is where diversity becomes very important uh but you know what i'd, I'd love to get more information from you i mean look let's get on a call right book a call with me let's talk about it how to how to structure your diet to maybe get you on track right tyler t appreciate you tuning in great stream appreciate the guidance absolutely i'm here every monday folks that's right one month of feeling amazing there we go let's keep racking up those months let's keep racking them up thank you you're awesome my mom just heard what you said about the fruits she's going to book a call with you there we go that's what i'm talking about that's right bring the friends and family to the monday night live stream there we go i put out a ton of very important free information on these streams i want to help as many people as possible all right i think i got through all the questions and whatnot appreciate everybody tuning in like the stream if you like the stream book a call with me or sign up for the 12-week mentorship all right definitely um I am always at work, right? I want to see everybody do well. I want to make sure everybody understands the assignment. So yeah, there we go. All right, folks, I think I covered it all tonight. I put out a lot of details and information tonight. So I covered everything as best I can, but I'll be back on next Monday. Business as usual, Monday Night Live, right? Um, and I will post that once I'm dead set on the topic for that discussion. I might do a video review, actually. I got uh, e uh, Adriana, if you're still in the stream here. Uh, I am going to look at that video you sent me. I'm going to save it. And I'm going to get some clips uh, to talk about because that seems very interesting. All right, so that's going to be a spicy one. All right, folks. Appreciate you for tuning in to the Monday Night Live. I do this every week, 8 p.m. Eastern. And, uh, yeah. I'll see you then.